A friend of mine who used to be a very militant atheist, and then they eventually came around to believing in God. Not believing in religion, but believing in God. And then they became Muslim. And one of the things they said about Islam is that when they read the end time prophecies in Islam, it felt like a newspaper from the future. Inshallah, in this short period of time, everything that we're going to learn, this will go to show conclusively for anybody that's sincere, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is a true messenger of Allah. He claimed he was a true messenger of God. He spoke about the defeat of Rome and Persia. What we have is we have a narration from him. During the Battle of Khandaq, there was a massive rock and the Sahaba couldn't break the rock. So they called the Prophet ﷺ, who was physically very strong and he came and he struck the rock. And what did he tell the Sahaba? He said, you're going to conquer Syria. You're going to conquer Persia. You are going to conquer Yemen. He made it very explicitly clear. This is at the time when the Muslims were just in Medina and they're surrounded by 10,000 of their army and there's no other Muslims in Arabia. He didn't tell them you're going to win against these 10,000. He said you're going to win against Rome and Persia, which is incredible when you think about it because the Munafiks, they were the ones who were actually saying this man talks about victory when we cannot go to the toilet without arrows being shot at us. All of Islam was in one city and the Prophet ﷺ said this. Yet this is exactly what happened. The Muslims, after he died, they conquered Rome, they conquered Persia, they conquered the areas of Syria and Yemen, which were under Roman control, and they conquered Persia. So they beat them all. Now, what's interesting is what Barnbury Rogerson says about this astonishing event. He says, these two were superpowers. The equivalent today is imagine today Eskimos rise up and they take on Russia and they take on USA. That's how significant the Sahaba and their victories against Rome and Persia was. It was completely unpredictable. Another time a man came up to the Prophet ﷺ and said, tell me about the hour. The Prophet said, the one asked knows no more of it than the one asking. Then the man said, tell me about his signs. And the Prophet said, that you see the barefooted, unclothed herdsmen competing in the construction of tall buildings. Very explicitly clear, falsifiable, concrete, accurate, risky. Why is it risky? Because who had a tradition of building tall buildings? The Hagia Sophia, which is in Istanbul, this was built before this prophecy. And this is an extravagant tall building. The Romans had tall buildings, the Persians had tall buildings, the Indians had tall buildings, the Chinese had tall buildings, the Mayans had tall buildings. The Prophet ﷺ could have said they are going to compete with each other with tall buildings. However, he didn't say them. He actually pointed towards a certain type of Arab, the Bedouin Arabs. From the history of the Arabs, there have been two types of Arabs. They are city Arabs and they are Bedouin Arabs. What type of Arab was the Prophet ﷺ? He was a city Arab. The Bedouin Arabs were the people of the desert. They had goats and milk. They didn't have the sophistication of the city life. The Muslims came and they set up the first state, the rightly guided Khalifas. And then you had the Umayyads, then you had the Abbasids, then you had the Ottomans. You had massive Islamic civilizations. The Bedouin Arabs were doing the exact same thing during these great times of scientific achievement and economic and political achievement that they were doing before the Prophet ﷺ. They were milking camels, drinking camel's milk, and just herding sheep and camels. The Arabs at the golden age, when they were looking into the deep mysteries of the universe, these people were still using the feces of camel as fuel. Now, the prophecy is so clear that hundreds of years ago, Imam Nawawi says this, and remember, he's from the 13th century, right? He said the people of the desert and their like are the people of need and poverty. Everybody knows that. A time will come when the world will be laid open for them until they compete with each other in the construction of tall buildings. And Allah knows best. Imam Qurtubi, again in the 13th century, 700 years ago, 800 years ago, he says this. What is meant here is the prediction of a reversal in society whereby the people of the desert will take over the construction of affairs and rule every region by force. They will become extremely rich and their primary concern will be to erect tall buildings and take pride in them. So the Prophet ﷺ is talking about a group of people who didn't even have houses and he's saying they are going to compete with each other with tall buildings. Now what's interesting about this prophecy as well is the Prophet ﷺ and in the Quran 
it's not good to have extravagant tall buildings. In fact, the Prophet's own mosque, when it became too big for the people worshipping there, the Sahaba wanted to build it, extend it, and the Prophet didn't want that. In the Quran, Allah says, do you build on every high a monument? Vain is what you do. And you make strong fortresses as if you'd live forever. So if it was a prophecy which the Prophet wanted to come true, he would have said it about the city Arabs, which were the Sahaba, and told them, and it would have been a sunnah to build tall buildings. But he never did that. In fact, it was the opposite. However, today the tallest buildings in the world is in the Middle East, is in the areas of the Bedouin Arabs. The tallest building in the world is where? Dubai, Burj Khalifa. When Burj Khalifa was being built or completed, a rival family in Saudi Arabia, they said, we want to build a taller building. And this vein competing with each other is something that you find amongst them. What's interesting is that they discovered the black gold, which was something that made them go overnight from camels to Cadillacs, instantly. Now, who was ruling this area before the Bedouins that we have today? Turks. And how long were they running for? The Ottomans. 600 years. Oil was discovered, which made them super rich after the collapse of the Ottomans. If that oil was discovered when the Ottoman Empire was still there, do you think the Bedouin Arabs would have been building these tall buildings? Because they wouldn't have had the money. In fact, what we know from the Ottoman history is that they were great administrators and they wouldn't have built vain buildings like this. They had a complete different paradigm. Yeah, These people overnight, they went from being extremely poor to extremely rich, which is why you find them spending a huge amount of money and for them money doesn't mean anything. You literally have people alive today who are billionaires whose ancestors just going back two or three generations had nothing but camels and milk and goat and dates. And what you find is so many prophecies, so many beautiful prophecies. The Prophet ﷺ said, ahead of the hour, people will only greet those whom they know. Trade will become so widespread that a woman will help her husband in his trade. Ties of kingship will be severed. People will bear false witness and conceal true testimony and the pen will prevail. Here the Prophet ﷺ talking about trade severing of ties, the increase of literacy, right, with the pen prevailing. But what I want to say next may sound a bit controversial to you. All of this is not enough. What if I was to tell you a million of them is not enough? If we think miracles, prophecies are enough, we should all follow the job. Why? Because he's going to give you in front of your very eyes, things that supposedly look dead, come back to life. He's going to command the sky to rain and it's going to look like it's raining. He is going to do things which is going to confuse the hell out of you, right? Isa alayhi salam, whatever he did, we did with Allah's permission, Dajjal is going to claim he's doing it by himself. So why are we not going to follow Dajjal? What's the difference? The difference is the theology. What is his theology? Who's God? He's God. The theology of the Prophet is that Allah is worthy of worship. It doesn't matter if a man comes like him and says, Here's a miracle, here's a miracle, here's a prediction, here's this. If the fundamental theology is false, we don't care if it's a million miracles. So we will believe in the Prophet ﷺ even if he didn't come with any prophecies because of his theology. But if he comes with prophecies, they only add to the proof of prophethood. What's interesting in the world today is that the new atheist movement, they are priming the world to accept him. Why? What is their message? Firstly, rejection. Rejection of who? Rejection of God and religions. Two, what's their other message? Materialism. What's the Jal's main thing? Who's going to be attracted to him? People who are affected by it? materialism. The third thing is their focus on empiricism. We will only see what we believe. We will only believe something we can see. We want the miracle now. We don't want to believe, oh God, we can't see God. I want to see God. This unholy trinity of rejection of traditional belief in God, increase in materialism, which is the fodder that Dajjal needs to attract people, and the focus on empiricism. If they want a physical God, that's what Dajjal is going to be. Like I mentioned, it's not enough for the Prophet ﷺ to come with those prophecies. The Prophet comes and he says, this will happen in the future, that will happen in the future, and it happened. We don't go by miracles alone. We need to look at the character. Human beings, we sociologically conform to our society. We do what other people do, right? You go to a different country, you slowly start acting like them, talking like them, dressing like them. Studies have shown human beings deny their own perceptions to fit with society. 
There's lots of social experiments to prove this. However, what's interesting is this. The Prophet ﷺ raised the flag of Tawheed in a land of shirk on his own, which is wallahi more difficult than raising the flag of India in Islamabad. Why? Because the Arab society was a society which economically, politically, socially, culturally relied upon shirk. They love their ancestors and they love their idols. And they came up to the Prophet and they said, we'll give you money, women, wealth, power, whatever you want, give up your message. What did he say? Okay, I'll give you up. What did he say? He refused. He refused and he maintained la ilaha illallah. Now, anybody who studies criminology, when a crime happens, the first thing people look for is not the murder weapon or witnesses. The first thing people look for is who would have wanted this, the motive. The motive is the key indicator. What's the motive of a man who is being given everything? And he says, no, I will not take it. And that man for us, is a true messenger of Allah based upon his character. He cannot be a liar. He hasn't got the psychology of that. He cannot be insane because of the product of the Quran and the Sunnah, which clearly cannot be the product of an insane mind. So he has to be speaking the truth. And for us, enough knowledge of his character is proof of his prophethood. The prophecies which I spoke about, which are wonderful and great, that's if you like an additional argument. It is enough of his life, his Tawheed, his message, which is a message which resonates with the fitra, which is enough to prove he is the messenger of God. And that's why we will follow the Prophet and not follow the Dajjal. Everything good I've said is from Allah, every mistake is from myself. 